Thank you guys for taking the time. I know it's, it's busy with doing the, the photo shoot and everything else. And, but I want to start with, uh, I guess, the first question. How many years have you two played together? Too long. <laughs> uh, Any we're idea? We're in uh, probably our 20th season. A yeah, good question. I'd, I, I'd have to actually count them out, but I, I would say it's over 20 for sure. Yeah. Over 20 years. Other than you went to play with Stoughton for a year or two in, two years, in yeah. Manitoba. Why was that? Yeah. Just a change, be on, be of scenery, a change of scenery. It, it was a, yeah, needed a break from the grind of curling. And I actually took a year off, didn't play at all. Um, really hadn't planned on coming back until I got a call from John Mead uh, a full year later after taking the season off and weighed the opportunity against, you know, the, the cons, I guess. And we decided to do it. We know what, it's an Olympic year, so I want to talk about uh, the opportunity um, and what you think, well, both of you actually, um, the opportunity to be back in another Olympics after 15 years from the last one. I, I want to try to get into your mind because uh, you're a cerebral person and uh, yeah. how does it work? How are you thinking? Well, for me, I, I think the biggest reason I want to get back is now being a father and with my kids being 10 and 14. I think it'd be a pretty incredible experience to go and participate in the Olympics and have them be old enough to understand what we're going through and, and to be able to watch that. Uh, would have loved that to happen in person, but obviously there's no spectators this year. So if we are fortunate enough to go, they won't get that opportunity, but you know, they're going to be able to support us at home and watch on TV and see their dad playing at the Olympics. So that's kind of my biggest motivation is to, to provide that to them. Because when I went last time I was, you know, I wasn't even married at that time, um, let alone have kids. So just a different stage of my life. I think I'd appreciate it a lot more than what I did when I was 25 years old. I, you know, when you're 25 and you have that success early, you think it's going to come lots more in your career. And I learned pretty quickly after that, that it's, it's can take years and, uh, you know, it'll be 16, 16 years if, if we make it this year. So, uh, I think we'd appreciate it a whole lot more. Yeah, I, I agree with Brad. You know, we're in completely different stages of our lives now and um, having a family and someone to kind of share that with uh, would be super important. And I do think, you know, when we were there 15 years ago, we really had no clue uh, what was, you know, the magnitude of it, but also, you know, the possibility of getting back. I think, uh, you know, we'd probably enjoy this one much more uh, than we did the last one in terms of taking it all in. And we were so focused on the one, the one goal um, that we may have missed out on some other opportunities that, uh, you know, that were there for us. That's a really good answer, actually, because it's true. And to, uh, to expand on that, I'd like to hear a bit of the difference, a bit of the difference, but also how you're training now, um, trying to be ready to win at... at your experience level now versus back in 2005, what you did to get ready for that try. It's, it's, it's got to be a little different. Uh, dramatically different. I, I think going into the 2005 trials, we were playing every single week. And, and because we needed those games, we were you know, not as experienced as some of the teams we were going to play. And, and we wanted to gain that, that experience. And plus, we had to try and get Russ into it, uh, into the mix. So I think we played like two out every three weeks, if not more going into the last trials or uh, 2005 trials. Uh, this time around, we're only playing three events. You know, we played last three events, three events leading into the trials. Um, total. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So well, and, I, I didn't, I didn't, I had no idea. Yeah. Wow. So okay. the, part of the reason behind that is, is we're in a different place in our career. Like we don't need those games to be ready. This team as a unit has been together now for eight years. So it's not like we have to learn to play with each other. Um, the biggest thing for us is to make sure that we're healthy, we're rested, and we feel good going in. And what we've learned over the last number of years going into the trials, or at least going into the latter part of November, early December, when the trials usually are, and we had the Canada Cup in other years, we always felt tired at that time of year because we had played so much. We had played six, seven, eight, nine, ten events up to that point, and we wanted to avoid that. So you know, we've, we picked Oakville last week. We're here in Oakville again uh, for the slam. And then we have another slam and then obviously the trials. So uh, not getting anywhere near as many games as some of our other teams, but we're going to be, I think, much more rested going into the trials than some others. Mark, your thoughts on, uh, on your scheduling off ice, not so much on ice, but how you're uh, 
the training um, so that in, in Brad's words, you're trying to be ready, fit, yeah. but not tired, ready, peaking at the right time. That's a lot of thoughts. Yeah, we've, we've been planning it for a long time. So how, yeah. how did you plan it? I, we, we, I think we've done a great job. We got the ice uh, available to us a little bit earlier than usual in St. John's, uh, which allowed us time for a training camp, full team. You know, Jeff's still Jeff's living in, in Edmonton now, so having the f- full unit together is important to us. So we've structured out our season where we play, have a training camp, or Jeff comes down, we have a training camp, then go play. Uh, it's been, I think we've managed it as well as we can. We've we've been planning it for a long time. Um, you know, having th- three, four, five day training camps with the four of us in in St. John's uh, with coaches down helping us technically. Um, you know, just working on some little things that we feel like are going to be our our main area of opportunity to improve. You know, we're, we're not trying to make big changes here now. It's just where we're going to be- get our biggest bang for our buck when it comes to playing the event and the trials. really want to talk to you guys about being a Canadian team who has already been to the Olympics. That's why I'm asking you guys uh, versus, say, a real young team. Um, and teams from outside of Canada, a lot of times, they're sort of directed and run by the uh, the national uh, coaches and, and situation there. But for you guys, you're sort of self-run. Um, I'd love to hear. So you win. You win. End of November, you're going to the Olympic Games. All hell breaks loose. Yep. I'd love to hear your, your organization behind you to deal with the media, to deal with sponsors, to deal with that. Because I don't think a lot of people really know what goes on behind the scenes to be prepared. Yeah, it, it really is a storm. And, and you have no idea what you're getting into until the day after and, and you wake up and all of a sudden you're thrown into a meeting and stuff starts coming at you. And then you get home and you realize everybody wants a, you know, a piece of you and wants some attention. And you know, it's a chaotic two or three months from winning the trials to, to go into the Olympics. And most teams, I don't think, are prepared for it. I think we have the luxury of having gone through it. Uh, and when we went through it again, we really, you know, we let Curling Canada kind of run it for us. And we realized as we were going through that there were times when we were slow to put our hand up and say, hold on now, we need to make some decisions for ourselves. And, and we made those decisions, but I think it was probably a little later than what we should. Uh, so I think with the, the stage of our career that we're at right now, if, if we are fortunate enough to go to the Olympics again, I think we're going to control the process very much. And, and I think it's going to be the four of us that are going to, that are going to own it. And we're going to dictate how, how things go, uh, because we've been there. And, and at the end of the day, when you go to the Olympics, whether you're successful or not, you want to look back and say, I did everything I could and I controlled it. This was on me. Uh, you don't want someone else make a decision that's going to impact you when you're, you're at the biggest moment in your life. And I think for us and, and for me in particular, that's what I want to feel. So, you know, if I made a poor decision leading up to it, that impacted us, I can live with that. If, if it came from someone outside the team, that's harder to deal with. Yeah, with the way your management mind, that's why I wanted to ask you about yeah. the management uh, angle. Mark, uh, coaching. The role of coaching in the modern day curling game, it's changed quite a lot, I think, in the last 20 years. Uh, and you've got, of course, Jules Ochar, my coach for 30 years, and he's still with you today. Yeah. Um, the role of coaching on, on Team Gushu. Having Jules with us just adds that extra layer that we pr- we didn't have prior in terms of rock scouting. He just Jules is just a master with the numbers. He he knows who's thrown what, what percentages are thrown, um, and basically takes a lot of the guesswork out of it for us. You know, something that we don't have to think about when we're on the ice. Um, but also Jules, that experience that he has, you know, with yourself. It didn't matter what situation we were in, that like he just looked the exact same. It could be the highest stress situation. You know, we we're playing in the Briar in St. John's, Newfoundland, the most pressure we've ever felt. And Jules sitting back, and he's like, mm-hmm. sometimes you get, like, yeah, you're like, hey, dude, you awake here? And he's just like, no, you're doing good. Like, just yeah. get a little, it's a okay. And it's just that that calming factor for us was uh, is uh, very important. And I think you know certain situations you get yourself in, it's easy to get yourself wrapped up in the, you know, the magnitude of it. And Jules is just there. It's like, it's going to be okay. 
Mm-hmm. And just, just to add to that, you know, Jules handles the rocks, but we have Jeff Thomas as well that works with, with us from a technical perspective. So, you know, love is mine. I've been working with him. Well, actually, we've been working with him since probably we were 18, yeah. 18, 19 years old. Uh, so he knows our deliveries very well and can make adjustments, which is great. And then we have Aaron McGowan from a, a mental perspective. Uh, so we have a, a coaching team as opposed to, you know, one coach. Now, Jules is the one that travels with us the most and, and sits on the bench. And that's mainly because of his experience and how cool he is under pressure. Uh, but also, if, if we get in the middle of a game and, as Mark said, we don't like a rock, Jules will tell us which one to throw, and, and generally he's right. I would like to uh, ask you about a game, a situation, um, if you guys can remember. I think Mark will remember. Um, Nicholas Adin, you're going to play Nick in the final. And you had played Red Rocks quite a lot in that event. Nick Adin had played the Yellows on B and had shot over 90% two or three games in a row. Uh, you had a meeting as to which rocks you're going to take, and you liked some of the reds, uh, and you were kind of hoping to take reds. And then Brad, uh, well, um, what do you think, Jules? Well, Nick and Dean just shot 93, 95. You just mentioned percentages. Um, so you took yellow. Do you remember the game? I'm trying to think back now. I'm- and Oscar Erickson in the final actually shot 39% with the two reds because you took yellow. And I just wanted to bring that up. Okay. I wanted to see if you could remember that because that's, that's telltale. When you're going to take reds, Jules says, well, you could. Yeah, and, and Jules would only speak up if he was really confident in that yeah. situation. So when he speaks and says that, you're, okay, let's, we're, we're going to do that. And that's a trust we have in him because, you know, he, for him to speak in that moment, he's confident that this is the right move. And when he and says that, cleaned up that game. Yeah. Oscar, and, and, and was 29, we, 38, some crazy number like that. Yeah. I, I think it might, it, well, I, we've only played Nicholas, I think in a couple finals, it would have either been a slam final. It was a slam or, final. Or, okay. A slam yeah. final. Yeah. Uh, actually I do remember that we scored five, I think in the second or third end and it was, yeah, we, we won that game pretty, pretty easily. Um, but yeah, we just trust him. You know, he, he knows his stuff. He does his research and has a ton of experience. No tick zone. Uh, world championships thoughts mark i'm fine with it i think out of all the the rule changes that's the the easiest one to kind of wrap your head around um i i've got i i like it and we've also tried it at the slams yeah. too so you know, I, I just don't like the fact that they're experimenting at the world championships with some of these other rules. Uh, the tick zone, we've tried that at slams. And, and I think for the most part, teams actually either enjoy it or don't mind it. So I think it's worth trying that at the Worlds. But some of the other rules. Well, let's walk into them. We, four, yeah. four minutes per end. <laughs> well, we, we have tried that and yeah. it went over like a fart at a funeral. It, uh, <laughs> you know, it, none of the teams like it. And, and the viewers, more importantly, didn't like it because... Some of the key moments when you're watching curling are when you get the conversations between Mark and I or skipping a third about what to do, and you get those complicated ends. And those complicated ends can't be completed in four minutes. So we're going to lose that because as a team and as a skip, I'm not going to get myself in that mess because I know I'm going to run out of time. And I think we're going to really impact the actual product that we're providing to the viewers by cutting it down to four minutes per end. Yeah, the, the drama that's created through the course of a whole game ends um you get to the sixth seventh eighth end those ends although you know you want them to be worth the same amount it's certainly not the the pressure that comes upon making a decision like if well you know if it's a close game you really like let's think about this you know we don't have time to think about it anymore because there was ends where brad was calling a shot and we'd talk about it for a couple seconds but next thing no you got to make a decision and he's running down grabbing the rock and you really don't have that the build up to the next shot. No extra ends. Three for an outright win. Two for a draw to the button win. One for a draw to the button loss, and zero. I guess first of all, your 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 thoughts on that. So initially, I'm I'm not against it, but I'd love to see it experimented at at a slam or at some big events before it's brought to a world championship. That was my initial feeling on that. I think we've had a little bit of experience trying that at the Continental Cup because there's no extra and you get a a half a point or or whatever it is there. Uh, And I know we've had the situation where you know, we're, we finished the seventh end and we got a one point lead and we're like, oh, this is a really bad position to be in because you know, we, we either got to try and force him to one for a half point or do we go hard for a steal for 
for the two points. It just, it really changes the, the dynamic of the last three ends, I believe. Um, and I'm not against that. I just love to see us try it and see how that product translate to the viewing audience, because this is what all these decisions are made for. We're trying to get more viewers. We're trying to get a better TV product. So if we're going to do that, let's, let's test the product before we give it to the public, which is what we're doing at the world championship, which year in year out is our biggest showcase. So I I think we, we need to just slow it down and test it before we give it to the mass audience. Mark, do you think part of the, the, uh, the thinking behind the no extra ends has to do with in a world championship, X amount of teams, and you can have a real log jam with tie breaks, but they don't want to have tie breaks. Yeah, well, obviously it is. They want to they want to try to eliminate tiebreakers, so you're you're giving points to different amount of points to try to separate teams. Uh, you know, the draw the button is one one shot, and you know it could mean the the difference at the end of the the week. So you know you have. A, you know, poor ice conditions at the end of a game for a, a draw the button, anything like that. It could change your whole week. And, you know, I'd, personally, I don't like being eliminated. I don't think a team should be eliminated via t- no tiebreaker. I think if you've ended up with the same record, I think you should have to play down for that spot. Yeah, I don't love the draw the button part either. Like, if you're going <laughs> to tie, just tie, yeah. you know, and, and let it be. And then if you're going to win, win. Like, this draw to the button thing, there's just too many variables. And we've all had picks or, you know, little mini picks that impact it. And all of a sudden, one shot at the end of the game when the ice is deteriorated, oh, boy. Uh, you know, there's... You might see the real Brad Goose. Yeah, you, well, you're going to see a lot of real curlers come out. Um, and And... Again, I, I just I'd love to see it tested before we bring this out to a you know a huge event like the World Championships. Yeah, I think at the end, like I, I agree with Brad there. You, you know, you have three points for an outright win, and then one and one, like you eliminate the the two, you get one point for a tie. Change then you're getting a change in strategy anyway, um, based on are we going to go for it for the three points, do, or are we okay with one point here? Um, I think that is enough to change the amount of points in the standings to to end up, you know, getting closer to not having tiebreakers anyway. Yeah. And we're saying it because from our viewpoint, we're going to win a lot of those one points on a draw of the button. But I just don't think it's the fairest way to, to impact a game. You know, at least if, you, if you're going to do it, let's do what we do at, you know, used to do at the slam where you have the whole team do a draw of the button and, and you know, calculate the total. You know, have it more of a team-based thing than one shot, one individual. You know, if I haven't thrown a draw since the first end, in all likelihood, we're going to have Jeff throw it. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's on him. I think it should be a full team if you're going to do it at all, which I don't think you should. So anyway, talking to circle. <laughs> let's, let's move on. Next question. You definitely had a feeling. You, yeah, you had fe- yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a nerve. There's Hit a nerve there yeah. a little bit. Loosen up. Loosen yeah. those shoulders yeah. up. Yeah, exactly. 